the sidelines of 9th uh, CFA Investment Conference, which is happening in Mumbai right now, I have with me another special guest, Mr. Mihir Desai, he's the Professor of Finance at Harvard Business School. Mihir, wonderful chatting with you. Thank you very much for chatting with us. My pleasure. So, Mihir, uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, in your overall, uh, overall scheme of things at Harvard, you must be analyzing when you're teaching this course, a uh, lot of global companies. Uh, we've just seen two Indian companies break in the $100 billion market cap uh, club. Yeah. So a lot of people are asking questions, and what will it take for Indian companies to come in the, say, 25, 30 most valuable companies? Interestingly, it's just dominated by the Chinese and the American companies. Uh, being in, of Indian origin, you must be having a close eye on corporate India. What are your thoughts there? I think in a way, um, the companies that have succeeded, we should be extremely proud of. But the puzzle remains why we don't have more large Indian companies. Um, you know, people in India like to talk about the SME sector in terms of economic growth. But actually, I think the puzzle and the thing we really need is to have more large corporates investing. And in aggregate investment rates are, are somewhat low. And the puzzle is why we don't see more large Indian corporates becoming global players. And I think that's what we should be focused on. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, one is I think the dominance of promoters can be a good thing, um, but uh, it is puzzling. We haven't seen promoters willing to give up control. And I think, I presume that part of the reason for that is that being in control is really enjoyable. And that's, I think, problematic. <laughs> and I think, you know, what we would hope to see is growth by professional management that would be leading to kind of promoters scaling down their states. We have public companies working out in the world. And that, I think, is what we should see more of. Um, so I, I appreciate the importance of promoters in India, but I think it's also a reflection of, of, of the fact that they enjoy being in control. And that unwillingness to give up control worries me. So I think they're taking their returns in ways that maybe they shouldn't be. And it would be nice to see them investing more. How are you analyzing the role of policymakers, or I would say the relationship of corporate India with the policymakers? I'm to not talking about political leadership. But policymakers in general, regulators, sure. Uh, because this relationship is also plays a critical part. In how large a corporate India can become, or companies can become, or valuable, yes. or how much they attract capital from overseas. Yeah. And we've seen Chinese and uh, American companies also go through their own, uh, you know, rough patch as well. But sure. uh, we are seeing the evidence right now. Uh, how yeah. do we analyze that factor? Well, I mean, I think primarily I worry that Indian companies spend too much time thinking about policymakers. <laughs> in the sense that um, some companies' central competence is, you know, figuring out how policymakers are going to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's not a terribly productive way to go. So what I would love to see is more corporates focused on innovation, driving innovation through their organization, driving talent. That's what we want to see. What I fear is that there's a lot, there's too much time in India spent on figuring out the policy apparatus, which is not necessarily the most productive use of anyone's time. Great. Uh, let's, let's talk about another factor for Indian markets, which is suddenly has taken a lot of prominence. This is the corporate governance brand issues and how market assigns value yeah. uh, or discount, premium or discount to both high quality government, co corporate governance companies are getting a premium here. Yes. And whether the, if there is a doubt of corporate go governance, the market is treating these companies, uh, punishing these companies. Yeah. Uh, how do you analyze this particular point of corporate governance when values are assigned yeah. to corporates. Yeah, I think first off, that's great news, right? I mean, we want more investors paying more attention to governance. I think that will help beyond anything else. So I think that's fantastic news. The second is, how do you think about that? The first is, um, you know, situations where promoters are exerting control beyond their ownership state mm -hmm. through preferential shares or uh, other means. I'm skeptical about those and we should worry about those situations. And similarly, where we have promoters who are unwilling to uh, share the upside with other investors, I think that's also an area where we need to be concerned. So I think the good news is we are valuing it more than we've ever valued it before. And what I would love to see is spread it even more, which is the typical mechanisms that promoters use to keep control. If that's penalized sufficiently, they'll give it up. And I think that would be fantastic. You're also coming at a time when uh, the Indian economy is gaining prominence and size, it's climbing up the ranks of global economies. The, the per capita is on the cusp of crossing the two thousand dollar mark. Uh, do you see in the next couple of years there could be a J curve that historically beyond the two thousand dollar mark, the economy actually gallop ahead? Well, I'm certainly optimistic about the Indian economy. Having said that, um, so we should appreciate that the Indian economy has been levered to the world economy 
for a while now. And we can't fully expect that the world economy is going to perform in the next five years as it has in the last five years. So I think India will continue to do well, certainly relatives. Um, I do worry that some growth expectations, you know, where we achieve 9% growth in a sustainable way over time, I think that's kind of detached from reality. And I think that was an artifact of a particular time, a particular place. Sure. And so um, I'm, a, I'm optimistic about India. I, I only worry that we should have expectations that are attached to reality is perhaps slightly more than the arts. You must be also interacting with a lot of students who become fund managers later on. Yeah. You're consulting companies and funds as well as interacting with them. How are they viewing India? Because uh, from the perspective of capital flowing to India, both the FDI size uh, and portfolio investors sure. say, last one year portfolio investors have shied away from India. Yeah. But FDI flows have been okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts there? I mean, I think... You know, this relates to our earlier conversation, which is I think there is great interest in India for lots of obvious reasons. And at the same time, there's a sense of why aren't there more investable assets? And this goes back to our conversation about bigger companies, right? Which is why don't we have more big companies? Why don't we have more opportunities to create scale um, that one would expect in this setting? So I think there's a great deal of interest in India, but there is a sense also that uh, some people have gotten their fingers burnt. Certainly, some alternative asset managers have not been able to sustain high returns, with, um, both in private equity and in hedge funds. Um, and some FDI has gone, gone wrong. So I think there's always going to be persistent interest. But there also has been this undercurrent of suspicion, which, you know, it I think we have to understand that it's based on something. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we tend yeah. to think it's there's just terrible, reason. but there's a reason to it. And I think that goes to our public governance conversation, and that goes to the idea that there aren't enough scalable assets, you know, that, that there should be a pay Talk to us about your book. Uh, it, it actually relates finance with other literature, yeah. uh, humanity, etc. What, what's the essential point you're trying to try to more on? Why are you working? Yeah, it's a very unusual book. In, in the sense that I'm a traditional economist and I've never written something like this, but I think um, the problem with finance today is that it's being demonized and it needs fixing. And to fix that demonization, we need to let people into the world of finance and make it accessible. And the way to do that is not with equations of graphs. The way to do that is with stories. So the book goes through all the big ideas of finance, but in a totally non traditional way, with philosophy, with literature, with history. Um, so that is a way to help the demonization problem, meaning let's reconnect finance to underlying human concerns. And then second, hopefully we'll help fix finance, because I think chunks of finance are broken. And I think one way to fix them, um, I can appreciate the role of regulation or an outrage, but I think actually the way to fix them is to have people who are practitioners of finance reconnect to the underlying ideas of finance, as opposed to getting buried in their screens and their spreadsheets, which is what happens all too often. And by reconnecting to the ideas and their underlying humanity, I think we can actually expect this to behave better. So the goal of the book is to both um, help with the demonization of finance by allowing people in, and perhaps to help rehabilitate finance um, by making people who practice it understand the human consequences of their decisions. All right, Tamir, thank you so much, Mehir. Enjoy the conference. Thank you very much.